Um, so firstly, just to say that um, this is recorded. So if you don't want to be in the recording, if you could um, mute yourselves or, um, you know, uh, not mute, mute, sorry, stop the video. Um, so we will start, like we will post this via email later on, you'll be able to see it again um from the point on where i've actually said that it's recorded so don't think that you know if, if you appeared and you don't want to be recorded that you're going to be there forever <laughs> um so my name is gala um i don't know a few people a few more people joined there so i'll just talk to you start about uh, the chat about the sustainable fish cities campaign and what you can do as an organization or business and as an individual so if you would cooperate, just a second. So we'll do a 30 minute talk around 30 minutes, and then we have uh, a good bit of time for questions and answers. Um, yes, the, the recording will be sent to everyone later on from this point onwards from the slide. And if everybody could please mute themselves during the talk. Um, you can pose any questions at the end. We have half and half. So after the talk, plenty of time to discuss. Um, so the chat would be the best thing to do. Uh, Kate, if you can unmute yourself and say hi. Hello. <laughs> so Kate is the Living Seas placement student from Queens. And she is my right hand, left hand, sometimes both. Um, so she is going to monitor the chat because I, I can only really see the presentation at the minute. Um, so we'll do that in the end. Uh, if you have a really, really burning question, obviously, feel free to stop me. But I think you, because there's quite a lot of us, it would work better if we do it at the end. Okay, so a few uh, key things. Um, most of you are members, so you, you know who we are, but just for those that aren't, just a quick word to say that Northern, where Ulster Wildlife is Northern Ireland's largest local nature conservation charity, and it was established in 1978. And since then, we've been protecting wildlife both on land and sea. So uh, the majority of the unrestricted funds actually comes from the members, and we are proud to be one of the 46 independent wildlife trusts that are working across the UK. So together, we have a much louder voice than just um, an NGO on its own. And we are currently over 14,000 passionate members that provide those unrestricted funds. A quick word about what we do. So we focus on key species, um, species that by protecting them, we also protect, protect the environment. So species that are under threat, like uh, the flapper skate in this image. Uh, we also protect and restore places for wildlife. So uh, bogs, we have uh, 90 nature reserves. Nature reserves. Oh, I can hear feedback from myself there. Oh, sorry, I don't know why. Could, uh, I think that. <laughs> Stephen and Valerie Wilson, please mute themselves. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, we try to bring people closer to nature by doing all kinds of events and engaging even in online campaigns such as this one. And obviously we're working in the background, working with the government, um, with DARA in particular, and other NGOs to try and influence policy. So it's not all that you see, there's much more than that in the background. Mm -hmm. So this campaign, the Sustainable Fish Cities campaign, the logo of which you can see up here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you see my little laser? Yep. Yep, perfect. So uh, we are partnering up with the Belfast Food Network, um, which is a nonprofit organization that works on many, with a really wide range of stakeholders. And they have a really lovely, a uh, way of describing that from for farm to fork and everything in between. And obviously this is now from, I guess, fish to fork in this case. Um, so they are uh, trying to prom promote uh, sustainable food and as well as reduce poverty and just the distribution of food. Um, and they were established in 2014. So together with them, we're focusing on working on Belfast, but this campaign is also about dairy, which I'll get to in a second. So uh, overall, this campaign um, is a very ambitious one, and it's not new. It's new to Northern Ireland. There has been a previous attempt 
um, 2015, I think, but it didn't receive enough funding to make a splash. So we've, uh, we're trying to engage Northern Ireland now, Derry and Belfast for starters to get, um, to get it on the sustainable seafood map. So the idea is really um, to join the other 17 cities um, across the UK that have uh, signed the pledge to become sustainable fish cities uh, and Heathrow as well as an airport. Um, all the businesses that serve, even just that one tuna sandwich, they have signed the pledge that they will serve more sustainable seafood or avoid the worst, the most endangered species that are facing extinction. Um, so this, campaign is, if you're wondering how ambitious it is, um, it is absolutely huge. So there's 850 million meals served under this scheme annually. And this happens in shops, fish suppliers, restaurants, schools, tourist attractions, councils, all kinds of places. So it's we're not just talking about the um, hospitality sector. And obviously this is all supported by consumer um, encouragement and buying power. Um, so the campaign is um, conceived and coordinated by SUSTAIN. SUSTAIN is the Alliance for uh, Better Food and Farming. They are a UK based NGO um, and they work with other not-for-profit organizations that are working already on sustainable um, seafood issues, such as um, you might, well, this logo has now changed, apologies, but I kept it here because you might know it better than the new logo. So this is the Marine Conservation Society. So that's an NGO. Um, and the, ironically, not MCS, but MSC is the Marine Stewardship Council, which is an accrediting body, an independent, um, reviewer of what fish is sustainable and what not. Um, so how does a city become a sustainable fish city? So basically you need to have uh, secured pledges from a number of smaller and larger businesses and organizations, uh, which can mean schools and council catering, hospitals, um, higher education institutions, workplace canteens, Iconic businesses such as the Titanic, for example, um, and tourist attractions. So there's a, a scope for, uh, there's a lot of people out there already that are working towards sustainable food and seafood. Um, so with this campaign, we also hope to acknowledge um, their efforts publicly. So why is consuming sustainable fish important? Does anybody want to give me an idea? Please don't be shy. <laughs> No luck, anything at all, um, just to see what your thoughts are. So that species don't disappear? Yes, yes, perfect. That's definitely one of the main reasons. Um, so to answer this question um, in a more wholesome way, I'll first ask the question, what do healthy seas actually provide for us? The healthy seas provide much, much more than just food and jobs. Um, they also provide mainly oxygen. So a nice um, way to phrase it is that every second breath that you take is actually coming from the ocean because the little plankton, uh, phyto phytoplankton, uh, which are little tiny alga and kelp and other seaweeds actually produce just as much oxygen as you know the Amazon forest that we all think of when somebody says, where do we get oxygen from? Trees. So there's a lot of memes on the internet circulating that show really sad, like phytoplankton and algae that nobody gives credit to, <laughs> but they are very important. So the ocean also, healthy ocean, can uh, regulate the climate. It provides, uh, it also regulates the cycles of other nutrients, um, such as phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, the water cycle, so rain and the weather and everything that again goes, um, hand in hand with climate regulation. And also we get obviously a lot of medication um, and ingredients for medication from the sea. So in terms of climate regulation, since it's a hot topic lately, pun not intended, but it'll work. Um, so even though 25% of our carbon emissions are actually captured and stored by the sea, 
so far at the COP26 in October, there's only about 1% of funding that was given to ocean nature-based solutions. So yes, we started looking more into nature-based solutions, but kind of forgot about the ocean. The reason is simply because it's much more difficult to do that in the ocean, but it's not impossible. And often it, it, the main reason is people don't know enough about the ocean as they do about land. Kind of a away from sight, away from mind kind of thing. Um, also, in terms of transportation, obviously, 95% of every import and exports that come to the UK and, the, and Ireland are by ships. So really important thing there as well. So for the ocean to provide all these services, in a really ideal scenario, we would want it to have its food webs intact, or at least in a good condition its habitat, so the homes of all the animals, undamaged, for example, the bottom of the sea, which even if it's just sand, it might have a lot of things living underneath. And if it's perturbed, obviously all that changes. And it's water unpolluted. Now, obviously we can all agree this is not happening. <laughs> We're far away from this, but doing uh, each of us doing our bit actually can help change that. So just to show you how our seafood options directly affect the food web, food web and habitat portion of um, the three key things that need to be intact. Um, so looking at the biomasses, so to have um, a predator that, and for example, a tuna. So we love to eat predators because they are bigger and they have more flesh. Um, and tuna also migrates, so at long, big, huge mussels there that taste yummy. So one kilogram of tuna, to, to, for us to eat that, you would need 100 kilograms of smaller fish that the tuna feeds on to grow, uh, about 1,000 kilograms of even smaller, smaller um, fish and other organisms uh, that eat uh, plants and seaweed, and about 10,000 kilograms. So, for that one kilogram of tuna, that's a lot more involved. And, and the same way, if um, something in this chain changes, and particularly the top predators, the whole system can collapse. And it has happened uh, several times with different species um, across the globe. So this trophic pyramid kind of illustrates why it's really important to keep the food webs intact or in a healthy condition. The other thing to mention is fishing down the food web. So this term um, describes basically the process whereby fisheries in a given ecosystem are depleting the large predatory fish from the food web that the whole ecosystem collapsing, basically you just, if you've eaten all the big ones, you keep going onto the smaller ones, you've eaten all the smaller ones, you go even smaller and eventually we'll be eating peanut sized fish, which is not useful for anyone. Um, and will return economies. So fishing down the food web is a really big problem. Um, and in terms of what is currently the situation in the UK, um, so there was a review um, of the good environmental status. So it's like an, with 15 indicators to show um, how much progress we've done so far. And it turns out that 11 out of 15 indicators that have to do with fishing in one way or another were not met. Um, so fishing is still a big issue. Not all of fishing, obviously, but uh, the practices that haven't changed through time, they've just become more, more and more uh, fish, catching more and more fish, but not really changing their technique. Um, so also the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in 2020 um, mentioned that there's one, less than one third of all seafood is harvested sustainably. So this is from that department. And this one is from 2018, from a summary um, on the good environmental status for the whole of UK. Um, Okay, so and uh, we spoke about the food web. We spoke we spoke about uh, well, we didn't speak much about pollution, but I think that's probably a given. As if air is polluted, as when air is polluted, we are not healthy, so we can't live very well in the water. This is also very pronounced. So if there's pollution, there's the whole chain changes again. The whole food chain. 
um, a lot of animals don't survive or proliferate to an unhealthy amount, and then the whole ecosystem again collapses. In terms of habitats, um, fishing, fishing methods um, directly influence that. But there's also good, good other good reasons other than just the threatened ocean um, on its own why we need to um, eat sustainable fish. And these would be, if you look, for example, at this graph. So by now, I hope while I was talking, you might have seen all the images that fish, wild fisheries, wild caught fish, um, contribute much less um, to CO2 emissions um, comparing to beef and um, sheep. Now, this is a really generic uh, diagram. Obviously, if you go to particular, you know, sustainable farm and there's each case to their own, but in globally speaking, fishery, fisheries should uh, contribute less um, if you're looking at sustainable wild fisheries. Um, and also, if you're choosing sustainable seafood, we also protect the environment in another way by protecting habitats that are called blue carbon habitats. So blue carbon habitats are essentially um, seagrass, salt marshes, um, all kinds of different types of habitats in the sea that store, absorb and store, so sequester carbon. So they're helping us find, fight climate change, which is why they got this catchy name, Blue Carbon. So this is something that Ulster Wildlife through different projects is really looking at and working on as well. Are there any questions so far? No? Okay. I know there's questions in the chat, but um, there was any burning questions. I was wondering if, if you, somebody would want to shout them up. So, um, on top of all this, the ocean is also facing, as we mentioned, global warming, habitat loss, pollution, marine litter, and lots and lots of disturbance, um, particularly noise disturbance, where um, animals that rely on hearing to feed and communicate um, simply can't do so. So they're either displaced or um, they just don't thrive. And as a population, it's really, they, it affects them. Um, but this would be the biggest problem, the out of sight, out of mind. So this is an example with marine litter, but it's the same. Like when you look at the sea, um, even via Google, you can't see all those patches of deforested kelp forests or um, meadows that aren't thriving, seagrass meadows that aren't thriving, like you would if you looked at the Amazon or some areas. Um, so people just don't know to what extent and to what terrible extents um, unsustainable fishing um, is actually damaging the ocean and therefore us. So this is just to give you a little uh, context of what's uh, in Northern Ireland. So uh, according to a Food Standards Agency uh, survey, so the survey was called Food and You in 2017, which I'm afraid might be the, the latest one with this data. Um, there's very low seafood consumption in Northern Ireland compared to the rest of the UK. So about 60% never eats cooked seafood, uh, which is a lot. Uh, so we don't really have much interest in seafood, which is not to say that we're not contributing to the problem because on the other hand, we might not be interested in eating diversity of fish, but we love cod. We love salmon. We love the same species that are under enormous pressure over and over, whereas there's so many others that taste just as nice or maybe even better, depending on what you like. Um, and over 40% of all fish and shellfish um, is exported from Northern Ireland. So whatever our local fishermen catch actually goes to France and Spain uh, or mainland UK. Whereas we tend to import what we eat, which is a bit of an oxymoron because we do have fisheries here. So you would think that we would eat those, but instead the economy works in different ways. And then adding the whole uh, transport carbon footprint and the whole story of eating some fish from far, far away obviously makes, makes it much less sustainable. Also, Brexit has not helped the import and exports, and um, this campaign is now into its third year, but we only really launched it um, in February last year um, and re-strategized so many times because Brexit and COVID, obviously, 
who are just a big, big, huge impact on the hospitality sector in particular. Um, and even when you were when you think about workplaces, workplace canteens are closed <laughs> during lockdown. So um, it's been quite a difficult thing to um, navigate. So the pledge is simple to sign and everything is explained on our website, but uh, majority thing, the, the, the main reason is obviously to protect marine ecosystems as somebody mentioned. And the other reason is because consumers are actually asking for it. So according to the Global Seafood Consumer Survey in 2020, which is every two years, uh, by the Marine Stewardship Council and Globescan, which is a statistics company that do surveys, about 56% uh, um, of all seafood consumers globally are willing to pay more for seafood from certified sustainable fisheries. Um, so this is when it comes to buying, which just to make it clear, not all sustainable fish is more expensive than its less sustainable counterpart. It's not like that at all. Some might be, some are not, but um, we are not asking people to necessarily pay more. Uh, we're just hoping that through this, you'll understand the importance of what you're choosing to eat. And also a lot of consumers pointed that they uh, rate protecting the environment as one of the main reasons behind their decision to eat more sustainable seafood, whereas previously it was more about price. So it seems that as the years go by, there is more and more awareness out there. Um, and lastly, for businesses and organizations, for those of you that have influence um, with what food is served in your workplace, uh, we will promote and we do promote businesses that sign on our website and across our social media. Uh, we have like a little badge that we tweet and post about and we're the first sign up of Fish City, which is a, a lovely sustainable seafood restaurant in Belfast. We even did a press release, which I think is something that we'll continue to do um, as it works quite well. So if you're a business and organization, the best way to help and to join this campaign is simply by going to our website, Sustainable Fish Cities and I, um, and you download the, the guide, which gives you exact steps of what you need to do. If there's any questions at all, um, you can email me. This is also on the website, livingseas at ulsterwildlife.org. There's plenty um, of information there, but I'm more than happy to meet, um, hold talks, information sessions, trainings, whatever you think you need. Um, and just to um, finish with what we do with businesses is we offer free advice on which sustainable fish to eat. Um, and we educate obviously about the importance of sustainable seafood and their options. The Belfast Food Network is even creating videos with top chefs um, on cookery classes on um, new species that might not be as popular. And obviously, all this provides a really good networking opportunity for organizations that are already making those sustainable seafood swaps or are interested in sustainability. So you know who to talk to if you wish to proceed. And lastly, the free promotion that I mentioned. So this is just an example of a few things that we give out. We give those uh, sustainable fish swaps um, for species and what they taste like and some uh, tips from chefs. Also seasonal fish. So as with any animal and plant, apart from those that are farmed, but even those, you cannot, you ideally should not eat um, the fish when they're producing, just certain months of the year. So this helps you find um, what what not to eat and what to eat um, per month. And it is also quite useful because if you're doing this and say following a fishmonger, you will most likely get a fresh fish that is local because fresh fish doesn't travel really, really well. So you'll be um, both reducing the carbon footprint and not putting pressure on the, on the species as well as supporting the local economy. Okay, and I guess this is maybe why most of you are here tonight. So um, this is a really simple of how to get involved in as an individual. Um, so 
knowing what fish and shellfish to eat is a complete minefield. Like with anything we eat not these days, um, it's not easy to know where exactly it came from, but it's even harder when it comes to seafood um, because it doesn't only depend on the type of fish or the species of fish. I'm using fish as an example, but I mean, all seafood. Um, it's also about the location where it was caught, and most importantly, how it was caught. There are fishing practices that are sustainable and that are those that completely massacre the seafloor um, by, by fishing on the bottom, um, equivalent of basically just wiping out a whole forest at once. So as a consumer, you definitely hold the power um, of what seafood is going to be served on your plate or um, you, what you will buy. Um, in restaurants, you can ask for information about the fish that you're thinking of eating. Um, you won't always get the right answer, but at least you know you can you can make it a habit out of it to ask um, for that information and to understand a little bit more. And the main thing you can do as an individual is use the Marine Conservation Society Good Fish Guide. Um, so this is an NGO, so it's, I put those two labels here because if you're buying in a shop, you can be guided by these two. They're the only ones that um, are endorsed by the Marine Conservation Society. Um, whereas the Marine, uh, the Good Fish Guide helps you, you just write, and I'll show you an example if we have time, you just write down the species that you would like to eat. Um, and it gives you best options, worst options, why, where it was caught, how it was caught. And it gives them a, a, a five color um, sustainability index. So if it's green, it's good. If it's red, it's an endangered species or does a lot of damage to the habitat. The second way you can help is for Northern Ireland in particular, um, is spread the word. <laughs> we have had a really hard time and we are working uh, on this um, campaign for quite a while now. But if you think you have the influence or you would like to see change in the workplace or wherever you live or with your friends and family, spreading the words about what you can do in as, as an individual and what you can do as a business um, is, is absolutely the best thing you do. You can do. And obviously, you can share it on um, Facebook as well. Um, so this is just to say as well that this is all free, all these resources, both ours, um, signing the pledge, our help, uh, and the fish guide itself. So um, a lot of your members, so I'll be quick, but just to say thank you to our members for supporting us through this quite awkward and difficult times um, and for being here tonight for all of you. And if there's people that are not members, um, just to say that um, we have a 50% discount if you join in February as a member. February, sorry, January. <laughs> January. Um, so becoming a member of Ulster Wildlife might seem like, oh, they're asking us to pay again, but it's actually contributing to those unrestricted funds that we have a choice of how to use. Whereas if project money would come in and then we have to stick to the funders rules, which mostly obviously align with what we want, but we don't have the opportunity to expand further. And once a project stops, the funding stops. So there's a lot of good things that have happened that simply die off uh, or would die off without membership support. And that's where members are literally keeping us alive. Also, if you're interested, you can volunteer. We have a lot of volunteer opportunities um, and we have quite a few um, citizen science projects. Um, I run the Shore and I project, which is about um, taking pictures of little critters on the coast and um, all the training and everything is free. Um, you can follow us on social media and if you're a member, you can join the exclusive members group on Facebook, which where you can share your photos and uh, thoughts and such. Um, and lastly, just to finish off with, uh, this is just part of the online winter talk series. Uh, next week, we have climate change, what it means for Northern Ireland and what we can do. And this will be hosted by Dr. Anika Clemens, who is our Director of Nature, Climate and Environment. And you can see the rest of the talks on our events page. Um, so thank you very much. That is all from me. I will stop sharing now and maybe we could take questions.
And if you're interested, I can show you how to use the, the good fish guide. Okay, so yes. Uh, if, what was the question, Kate? Sorry, click the wrong next um, button. The one third of the fish being uh, fished sustainably, is that in Northern Ireland specifically, or is that for the whole of the UK? The whole of the UK. Whole of and the then UK. there was a lot of questions about um, how do you monitor and how can you really know what boats are actually fishing sustainably and could they not just lie? <laughs> um, there, the government is making it quite difficult to lie uh, because you have to report. So you get quotas and you have to report your catches every time. Um, and there are inspectors, maybe not as often as we want, but there's huge fines if you're um, caught lying. So you can only land a certain amount. Uh, problem being, there is obviously unregulated and um, illegal fishing going everywhere in the world. And that's something that's really hard to tackle. But in terms of the regulated ones, um, we are closely working through the um, NI Marine Task Force, um, which includes uh, RSPB and a lot of WWF and a lot of other organizations. We're closely working with the government to try and like adjust those quota. Um, so they take into account you know, more than just the species um, or more than just the location, but see the problem as globally. Um, and we are trying to influence directly um, the new fisheries bill that is coming out soon. So hope that answers a little bit of the question. <laughs> um, there was also a lot of questions. They've all gone now. All the chat is gone, so working off memory. Oh, God. But, oh, I'm um, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of questions about um, salmon farming and aquaculture and issues with disease going through the salmon. And can that be counted as sustainable if it's damaging the salmon's welfare? Uh, yeah, so again, with uh, from the two logos that I showed you, one is from the Marine Conservation Society, the darker blue one, and the lighter blue one was from the Aquaculture, uh, Aquaculture Stewardship Council, not society, sorry. Um, so not all <laughs> aquaculture, as with any business, are, is created equal. So they are the ones that use sustainable practices, and they're ones that don't. Um, there are ones that use more antibiotics, there are ones that use um, RAS, which who's, is a little fish that cleans uh, the uh, salmon of other critters that live on them and make it their lives miserable, um, that use that in you know, huge quantities, um, and that affects the population of the RAS. So there's, it's really a minefield. There is no simple answer, answer to go eat this or don't eat that fish. Um, some species, yes, but this is why I wanted to show you the good fish guide online. Um, um, is, it, is it okay if I show you this now quickly before we move on to different questions? If you could give me a thumbs up, um, either virtually or... Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, so, Good Fish Guide uh, from, of the Marine Conservation Society. So this is an NGO, they're not paid or anything. Um, they work exactly like we do. So let's say cod, complex one. So Atlantic cod, you click on the species, it will give you um, a best choice ratings and fish to avoid. Um, or if you wish to look at all of the ratings to understand where it's coming from, you can see the best choice ones first. So those are numbers one to two. So that's like the green end of the index. There's fisheries that need improvement. Um, and if you click on each of those cards on more info, you get the full description of how it's caught, where exactly it was caught. So it's not about just Irish Sea, there's also fishing units. So it's, it's really difficult to, to do this unless you're using the good fish guide. Um, and it tells you, um, you know, how often it's caught, um, what um, certifications does it have, if it, do, if it has any, um, and where the problem, problems lie. So for example, cod in Iceland and the Atlantic Northeast area in general, um, has a relatively good um, index. I mean, you don't need to know the nitty gritty of this, just knowing that it's a one or a two, so a green color is good. But if you're interested, you can see that problems still remain with um, 
the ways they catch the fish, uh, which could be more sustainable. And you can learn about what is actually happening currently to address this. So really, really simple to use. Um, I hope that you can also download this on your phone, of course. <laughs> there is an app for everything these days. Um, and it's a very well and comprehensive um, guide. There's even a guide for businesses, which um, I think is still in its infancy, but uh, it probably answers more questions about you know, price and how to get this fish for the hospitality sector, for example. Yeah, sorry, more questions? Um, somebody asked, is there any sustainable tuna at all? Or are they all bad? Uh, no, they're not all bad. There are types of tuna like albacore tuna. Let me see what else comes up if I click. I know I'm aware that I'm not sharing screen now, but um, they are. Um, albacore tuna is usually um, a good option. And then a lot of them, so basically the ones you should definitely avoid is bluefin tuna, be it Pacific or Southern tuna or Atlantic tuna, just avoid anything that says bluefin. Yellowfin and skipjack tuna, you might find good and bad options, but albacore tuna would be the best bet. But then there's other fish that taste similar, which you can try, for example, um, not, maybe not for the tuna swap, but you could try mackerel. Mackerel can, uh, is not 100% sustainable, but um, much more so than other options. Um, and there's also recipes on that website, which you can see um, and ideas on what to cook. Um, so a lot of people have already invested in answering those questions, I suppose. So it's just about some signposting you to the right place. Any more questions? Um, someone asked if you have watched Seaspiracy. Uh, of course I have. Yeah, no, I have. And it does make a lot of valid points, but it simplifies things. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that we could do for nature is wipe out humanity, but that's not the way it works. Um, so you do need a bit of a consumer realism, commercial realism rather, um, to to make a change um but it's good that it got people thinking about it and started about you know um the whole talk so there's good and bad things about it i guess that would be my take on it yeah any other questions also, Suspiracy is on Netflix. I just saw the chat there. I think it's probably still on Netflix. Um, okay, I can actually see the chat now. So, Kate, I don't. You know, <laughs> thanks for your help. Um, so, does the certifying organization, when considering sustainable, take into account uh, the energy used to catch the fish and the loss of net gear, which is the main cause of fish loss? Um, <laughs> yeah, so it takes into account a lot of different things. I'm not 100% sure whether it takes into account exactly the carbon emission portion of it, but I think that comes down to, I'll have a check and I can get back to you with this if, if you'd like to email me on the Living Seas email. I know who I'm answering to, livingseas at posterwildlife.org. Um, but then it is a bit of a, there's no one fits all, one size fits all with trying to be sustainable. You're with pretty much anything that we do nowadays, there's always some kind of a backflip unless you're growing your own food. So um, it's a question of moral, for example, would you rather eat sustainable Icelandic tuna, skipped or albacore tuna, or would you eat a species under extinction or under threat, rather, um, that's closer to home. So it's it's not an easy question. Um, which supermarket stock good options? Oh, I don't know. I'm not happy with either, but they do try. Um, but I, I I think Lidl's making um, quite an effort, but they all basically have a bit of both. So your best option is just looking for the Echo label. 
but only the blue tick or the if farmed the light blue tick that I mentioned the aquaculture uh, stewardship council if it just says sustainably farmed you know I could I could write on my forehead sustainably farmed it doesn't mean anything um How, uh, oh yes, is there any other questions that I maybe missed? Oh, I, I didn't mention anything about the ghost fishing, the ghost uh, fishing. So the phenomena of old nets being lost at sea um, or dropped on purpose, discarded into the sea, which yes, they still keep catching fish and all other critters um, while there. Um, I think it takes that into account, but the majority of those losses are not on purpose because fishing gear is very, very, very expensive and no fisherman wants to lose their net. So in Northern Ireland, for example, fishermen are encouraged to bring old nets back for recycling, which is something that the NI Fishery Harbour Authority is coordinating. Um, there's education programs going uh, around this and a fishing for litter, if anybody has heard of it. So that means that while you're fishing, you know, bring back the litter as well. So there's a lot of things that are happening to prevent this. And there's even organizations, other NGOs that use, um, well, use have volunteer divers that um, do these really risky uh, missions, retrieving those nets with floating devices, and then use that material um, to regenerate it into with with companies like uh, sports gear, carpets, curtains, all sorts of things. Is there anything so far that whoever who's ever question I answer that you feel like I? I, it's not enough that you would like to hear something else before I move to further questions. No? Okay. Um, fish farms in NI waters that have the ACS accreditation. I am not sure. I know there's the organic salmon farm in Glenarm, which is quite expensive. But having said that, it is a, an open pen um so it's it is having an effect on the surrounding area of the sea so i'm not quite sure i can have a look though now if you like um however keep in mind that even if you're looking for or kate would you mind looking that up just while while we're chatting um sorry i was reading the chat what am i <laughs> the uh whether they are any aquaculture sustain um Aquaculture Stewardship Council certified uh, products or farms in Northern Ireland. Um, I have a feeling that no, but let's see what it comes up with. But yes, do keep in mind that farming is not necessarily the answer. At least for some species, some companies, but um, a lot of the time you're much better eating uh, wild caught fish. And one of the <laughs> contradictory um, but one of the main reasons is that to feed these um, farmed uh, fish, you need to catch a lot of wild fish <laughs> to make fish food because it has a lot of protein. So you end up having to um, endanger other species um, to feed salmon, for example. Um, so while Kate's looking for this, just move on to the next question. Um, <laughs> In regards to benthics, um, so those charming flatfish, um, Dutch developed an electric bottom trawl method which doesn't touch and scrape the seafloor, but it stuns them and then it scoops them up. So um, unfortunately that method, I was actually there when at that little conference when it was first presented, it sounded awesome, but we now know that there's not enough information. Well, we know that it has a negative effect on surrounding species, so it doesn't electrocutes the whole of the bottom, um, but it does have an effect on fish and plankton larva, you know, planktonic larva and other animals. So it's not considered sustainable. Maybe if there was a, it, you know, it's very hard to find how much electricity will not disturb anything but annoy the flatfish. So it's a hard one. Um, should we protect certain parts of the sea from any commercial fishing? Yes, that's what, that would be the ideal 
situation. And this is what we're striving to do, to have areas that are protected, to form a network of marine protected areas or MPAs. Um, and this, yeah, it's, it's hard because there's still a lot of education that needs to be done on the level, um, both the government and fishermen, um, but there being lots of steps in the good direction. So recently, and we're in protected areas in Northern Ireland, there is no more uh, mobile fishing gear, um, just static uh, traps for lobsters and so forth. Not in all marine protected areas, but in the most important parts of them. So that is progress. Um, slightly slow, but it is, it is definitely progress. But that would be the ideal. Yeah, we cannot protect everything without impacting, um, you know, families that depend on this for work. Um, but having a network, which um, is the same thing as on land, if you have a network or pockets, smaller pockets of um, habitats connected, um, that is much more valuable than having one huge park nature reserve. Um, somebody mentions the octopus teacher. Yeah, definitely watch it. I doubt you'll ever want to eat octopus after that again. <laughs> um, um, just on the aquaculture yeah. in Northern Ireland, um, it seems that there were some. There was one in Korean, one in Uri, and one in Belfast, but their licenses ran out in on March 2021. They haven't renewed them yet. So, okay, so they're probably there. in the process of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the, what you can mostly see as things, farming shellfish, for example, like native oysters um, or, or scallops, but native oysters is something that we are focusing on as well. Um, that is sustainable because you're not impacting, they filter water. So you're, you don't need to feed them with anything. You just put them there. And as long as the method of collecting them is not damaging the um, the benthos, so the bottom of the sea, it's actually a really sustainable practice. Now, of course, you need to like oysters. That's kind of like a marmite thing. You either love it or hate it. Um, once a scuba life board where we were marooned for a couple of holidays in tiny Maldives, crew got the rest of us. Um, yeah, so sometimes, I mean, you know, a lot of fishermen get, get blamed for a lot and it's not fair because they get so much less support than farmers do, for example. So um, it's, it's, they do not want to lose. Sometimes they, there's a case of they're not educated or they don't have time, but it's, it's one of the, I think it actually is the world's most dangerous job statistically. Um, and your, your time constraints and the weather can be horrible. So, I mean, as lovely as the idea would sound that they bring everything that they can, it's an extra pair of hands that they don't have. So I think with programs like Fishing for Litter, there's definitely change. And um, as with any other um, area, you have fishermen that are really good conservationists and you have those that don't care. So it's just as anybody, they're not all bad. <laughs> um, Sorry, Kate, could you maybe read the questions out? Because I don't think I can keep up <laughs> while I'm reading. Um, there's one. How can we find more information about marine protected areas in Northern Ireland? OK, so that's a nice one. So you can go to Daryl's website. And they have a map of all the current marine protected areas. Um, you can also look at, um, I don't know, Kate, if you maybe have a chance to send a link in the chat um, and you can also have a look at the NIMTF so NIMTF NI Marine Task Force website um, they will have reports on consultations and motions that Dara had recently on MPAs so as a country UK has a lot of MPAs I think even Lee is leading worldwide but a lot of those MPAs don't have proper management plans, um, which again is something that conservation NGOs um, are working really hard to achieve, that there is a proper um, you know, action plan of knowing what, 
what is the status, when is it monitored, how is it monitored, and so forth. So it's not just a protected area that nobody knows what's happening in it. Mm. And somebody mentioned good to know farmed by valves are a good choice. Um, they are. There's, there are Pacific oysters, which are not native, which can create an issue because they can, um, they, grow faster and they do affect the ecosystem. So not, again, sorry to be boring, not all <laughs> farming is, or wild farming is uh, equal, but um, this is where the good fish guide just clears everything up. Thanks Kate for sending the two links. Any other questions? I think we've... I think we've gone through everything. Does anybody have anything else before? I mean, I, I'm I'm not in a rush. So if, if you're tired of me, by all means, <laughs> go have a lovely evening. How is bycatch not lender regulated? Um, <laughs> you're, you have a certain amount of weight as far as I know to, um, well, first off, you're not allowed to discard the bycatch before. You would catch all kinds of things. Um, that are not just the fish you're going for. And therefore, you would then just throw whatever you don't need back in the sea. And it, by the time it goes back into the sea, it's already dead. So you're still doing a lot of damage, just not knowing how much now, um, which fishermen don't actually like. You're not allowed to put it back. So you have to land everything. You have to bring everything back. So, and it's, you report what and how much of it you caught. So that's in terms of catching. Yeah, I mean, there's also seabirds and other things that you might harm and that they will not end up on your boat. But in general, um, this is the way that this is regulated. And I think this might be the last question. What is the most sustainable fish available in Northern Ireland? If I say one species, then everybody will go and eat that, and then it's not going to be sustainable anymore. So there's a lot of good options there. So you can look at um, mackerel. Um, scallops are making their way as a fishery, um, are making their way towards uh, more sustainable um, options. They're, they're not there yet, but they're on the way. Same as Dublin prawn or nephrops. Uh, which are local fisheries. Um, the most sustainable, one of the most sustainable would be small lobster fisheries, but they are all exported to France and Spain because they get better price for them there. So <laughs> you can try that. Um, but local fishmongers and yeah, just, just asking at your restaurant, I think will give you much better options than focusing on one species. Does that answer the question? Um, that's Anne and Alistair. Yeah, okay, that's good, thank you. Well, um, if you have any other questions at all, please don't hesitate to contact um, the Living Seas email, um, or if you wanna take part in any other marine events or programs. Uh, oh yes, thank you, Kate. I, um, I was gonna add that in the email, but um, Kate just sent the Good Fish Guide link there. Um, but yeah, I have it on my phone, super easy. Um, and thank you, Kate, for the assistance. <laughs> and good night to you all. <laughs> I hope you enjoy the next winter talks and thank you for coming. <laughs>